Assalamu alaikum everyone, this is Mr. Middlepath. I hope everyone is doing well. This is part three of my series on finding a wife the Islamic way. And this series is going to, this video is going to be about red flags when looking for a spouse. So I want to open it up with the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu It's in Bukhari and Muslim. Tunkahu al maratu li arba'i li maliha wa li hasabiha wa li jamaliha وَلِدِينِهَا فَضْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَاك So what that means is the Prophet Muhammad is saying is that someone marries a woman for four reasons لِمَالِهَا Her money وَلِحَسَبِهَا Her lineage وَلِجَمَالِهَا Her beauty وَلِدِينِهَا The fourth one فَضْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَاك So look for the person that has deen Taribat yadak means your hands will be filled with dust. And this was an expression amongst the Arabs. So scholars have two different interpretations of this. One, one interpretation is that your hands will be filled with dust if you do not look for the one with deen. And what it means when your hand is filled with dust is means your hand will be filled with dust out of poverty because of how uh, hard poor people work and their hands get dirty, right? So your hands will be filled with dust out of poverty. And... The other interpretation was that this was kind of like a saying that meant the opposite. Kind of like how here in America, we might say, yo, that's the baddest football player on the field. We don't mean that they're bad in terms of skill. We mean that they're actually the best player. So we say we're the, they're the baddest player. So, taribat yadak, your hands will be filled with dust. They actually mean it in the opposite sense that it would be successful. If you look for the person with deen. So either interpretation, the meaning is the same. That you'll be successful if you look for the person with deen, or you'll be in poverty if you do not look for the person with deen, which is a very deep meaning because poverty can come in many different forms. So if the number one red flag is, we'll just put it here, lack of deen, right? And we can say lack of deen in many things, religiosity, spirituality, piety, practice, everything. And so how do we know if someone has a lack of deen? That's what's going to fill in the rest of this board. Before we go into that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I want to give a disclaimer here, is that a lot of people make this mistake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this mistake in the Qur'an. In Surah At-Tahreem, so the 10th verse is ضرب الله مثلا للذين كفروا امرأة نوح وامرأة لوط كانتا تحت عبدين من عبادنا صالحين فخانتاهما فلم يغني عنهما من الله شيئا وقيل ادخل النار مع الداخلين So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the example it's literally when it's ضرب الله مثلا Allah gives the example of the wife of Prophet Nuh and the wife of Prophet Lut they were two women that were under the protection and the leadership of two pious people a prophet and another prophet and not only uh, a, a, another prophet Nuh was one of the greatest prophets of the five Ulil Azm min al, min al -rusul, the, the most highest uh, status of the prophets is the, those five and I'll get into that uh, another time inshallah it's not the topic of the video so they betrayed them so those two wives betrayed their husbands who were prophets فَلَمْ يُغْنِيَ عَنْهُمَا مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَقِيلَ دخول النار مع الداخلين. and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not you know accept this and basically put them in the hellfire with everybody else and just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't like look and say oh you all, these people are the wives of prophets so I'm just gonna let it go it's like no you disbelieved and you betrayed the prophet so you're out you know you're out of heaven and then the verse after amanu. so in the first verse Allah is saying Allah gives an example to the people who disbelieve the wife of Lut and the wife of uh, now in the next verse Allah saying, and Allah gives an example of the people who believe Imra'at Fir'aun the wife of Pharaoh and I have another video where I talk about Pharaoh and his evils and how he was the biggest tyrant in the history of humanity so you have the wife of Pharaoh إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ ابْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ If she's asked her Lord, she made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said build me a house in Jannah and save me from Pharaoh and his evil deeds and save me from this oppressive people. And then the verse after it, وَمَرْيَمْ إِبْنَةِ عِمْرَانَ الَّتِي أَحْصَنَتْ فَرْجَهَا فَنَفَخْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِنَا وَصَدَّقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهَا وَكُتُبِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ And Maryam, the daughter of Imran, 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him. Alati ahsanat farjaha, who protected her chastity, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her the uh, the spirit. Wasaddaqat bi kalimati rabbiha wa kutubihi wa kanat min al-qanitin. And she believed in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in his books, and uh, she was a righteous person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving three big examples here that we need to pay close attention to. One example is an example of evil that comes out of a very good home. And the other example is of righteousness that comes out of a very evil home, Pharaoh's home. And the third example of, of is righteousness that comes out of a righteous home, which is Maryam, who was the daughter of religious uh, people, Al-Amran, right, who was also a prophet. So these examples are very important. When we're looking for what does it mean that someone has a deen and we're looking for these red flags, just because someone wears a hijab doesn't mean that they're a good person. Just because someone has a big beard and prays at the masjid doesn't mean that they're truly close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like we had the example of the wife of Lut and the wife of Nuh who betrayed them, just because they were the wives of prophets doesn't mean that they're not going to hellfire at the end of the day. And just because you have the wife of Pharaoh and Pharaoh was the most evil man doesn't mean that there wasn't a righteous person in that household. So you have to take all of that into consideration when looking at what does it mean for someone to have a lack of deen. A lot of people make this mistake where they marry someone who they think is religious because of their outer appearance, but then they get uh, hoodwinked later on and they find out, wow, this person is not what they seem to be and how did I end up in this situation? It's because they did not look for the red flags. So let's go into the red flags. How do we know if someone does not have a, uh, how do we know if someone has a lack of deen or not? Uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad says in another hadith, Al-Mar'u ala deeni khalilihi. Falyandur ahadukum man yukhal. That the person is on the path of their friends. So one should look at who they're befriending. So then number one here is friends, right? The friends group, who they're hanging out with, correct? That's, that's an easy one. Number two is activities. Okay, so let's just put number two here, activities. And I will say this, and I don't care what anybody says, you need to go on their Facebook, Instagram, whatever they have, and look at what they like, and look at what they're sharing, and look at what kind of things that they post. Again, it's an outer shell. It's like a hijab or like a beard. The, the, Things that you like online is an outer shell, right? It doesn't really tell you exactly what's going on in that person's heart and that person's mind. Maybe they're putting on an appearance in public, but in private, it's completely different. You know, I doubt that people will like weed videos online, you know, and they're looking for a husband or wife at the same time. But sometimes that happens. You have people who have secret habits, secret uh, vices that they can't get over or they don't want to get over, and they're not necessarily going to share that online. But this is still a good first look, right? So, three is outer appearance. With the caveat that we understand that, that these can kind of be faked, right? This, not so much. The friends are their friends, right? So this is hard to fake, can be faked. And people, when they're looking for a spouse, they want to get married or whatever, especially women, can be very deceptive on, on, on these types of things. So you need to be careful. Brothers can do that too. So women also need to be careful, which brings me to number four. And number four should be number one for me. This is a really big red flag. Making a move, right? So let's say you do get to know a brother or a sister for marriage and you're interested and you go to the family, all of that stuff. When they get comfortable with you, do they try and make a move on you to do something haram, to, you know, ask for your pictures, to try and kiss you, try and do anything haram? I'm not saying that you go up to a family's house, you don't bring flowers with you, you don't say and you're not nice, and you don't try and like talk uh, nice words and, and beautiful words to whoever it is you're trying to propose to, or the family, and letting and, and like you know, complimenting the family, complimenting the sister or the brother, and saying you know that I really want to marry, all of that good stuff. But what I'm talking about is haram things, things that you're not allowed to do, like touching, kissing, looking at uh, something you're not supposed to be looking at. She could be showing you her body, or you could be showing her parts of your body that 
you're not allowed to do yet. So if someone's doing that, that's a huge red flag from either side, a very big red flag. And this is more for the sisters looking at the brothers, because a lot of brothers, they can go to classes, they can do all the, the Quran classes they want, they can do all of the lessons that they want, but at the end of the day, if they can't protect you from their own desires, how are they going to protect the marriage when they get into it, right? Number f So this also, I would say, can be faked for a short time only. Eventually the character will show. This can be faked for a short time. Another thing that can be faked that you guys can and girls can look for is how they speak of others. Okay? They will speak of others. I'm especially talking about family. Friends kind of matter too. You know, if someone's talking bad about their friends behind their back, then, you know, that's not necessarily a trustworthy person. But friends, is spe uh, family especially, I'm sorry. So let's look at family here, right? Family, this is one of the big ones, right? And this is more for a brother looking at a sister. A lot of the times a sister can say all of the good stuff. Say, I, I love uh, Dean, I, I like... She, trying to hide every red flag ever. And she knows that that's not what she's about, but she's going to try and present that image, right? And uh, what's more difficult to hide, though, is how they talk about their family. Eventually, it's going to come out because he or she knows that if they say bad things about you, that's going to end the relationship. And they might not want to do that. But they think it's safe to talk about their family because they're opening up to you. They're telling about their family. They're talking about their secrets, about their life, and how they want to get out of here or whatever right and how they want to get married but how do they talk about their family right are they vicious are they cruel are they savage are they mean how are they complaining when they complain especially when they get angry how do they talk about their family how do they flip on their family do they say like i wish i was never born i hate my family i hate their guts so much or do they say like you know i wish things were different you know it's kind of sad that things are the way they are like how do they complain you know and think about stories that we have something like cinderella for example and i'm not bringing this up as a joke cinderella is not simply like a disney movie that came out 100 years ago this is like very ancient stories that show up in many different cultures chinese have their own version of it every a lot of cultures have their own version of the cinderella story which is basically the same theme a good girl who puts up with the abuse of her family and keeps her good natured spirit and eventually marries a very good person and the family i think some different versions are different. They either die or, or like, I remember reading one weird version where like birds, or like being told of one weird version where like birds peck out their uh, the, the sister-in-law's eyes. I don't know if you guys know the story or not, but basically she grew up in a, in a, in a bad household and they were like taking a, mistreating her and she eventually meets a prince and she marries the prince and, and lives happily ever after. But the point of that story was that she dealt with the abuse with the good kind-hearted nature. So. Does this person have a good, kind-hearted nature? When they're angry, do they flip savage, or do they keep their good, kind-hearted nature and maybe complain? Everybody complains, but they complain in a way that doesn't alarm you, you know, because how they complain and flip on their family when they're angry is how they're going to complain and flip on you when they're angry, because you're going to be their family after you get married. So another thing is, how do they talk about... So this is also hard to fake, right? Hard to fake for a long time. Another one is discussing money, right? Let me just get rid of that circle because it's not as important. But it, but it does show the person's uh, uh, character, money, right? How do they talk about money? Right? If you're low on money, would they encourage you to do something that goes against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or would they say, look, it doesn't matter that we don't have money as long as you know, you're not doing anything haram. Right? This is more for the woman talking to the man. This is what the man needs to watch out for. Because you're never in a guarantee that you're always going to be in a good financial situation. So 
you need to understand that will you have a wife that supports you when you're low on cash or will she encourage you to go out of your ethical, uh, what is ethically okay when you're out of money? That's very important because some women will be like, yeah, it's, it's fine, you know, just, just work and, you know, um, I'm trying to think. I know some families out of desperation. I'm not judging anyone. I know some families out of desperation, they have to do this. But let's say like, yeah, just work at that corner store that sells alcohol. It's not like they're all selling alcohol. They're just part of their sales are alcohol. And, you know, just part of it. You know, it's okay. Just work in that store. Versus a, a woman who says, no, just we'll be patient until we find another job. And then, uh, you know, let's just, let's just wait. Maybe we can find something better. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take care of us because he's the one who provides. Again, I'm not judging anyone. I know some people are actually put in a very difficult situations where they do have to make those type of choices. But I'm speaking in a general sense here. What kind of uh, talk comes up when money comes up? You know, because if someone's putting... Basically, guys, lack of deen here, right? It's going to translate to... It's going to equal... Do they put... Anything, I mean anything, over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, over their deen. Over deen. Because anything that they put over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including you, is a red flag. Okay? Just, it's, it's that simple. And I'm just kind of showing you guys things that could pop up. But there are so many red flags that could pop up. But this is kind of the essence of it that you're looking for. What is it that they put in their lives over the religion, right? Because if you're a Muslim and you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator and he's all-knowing and that his laws come and the laws come from an all-knowing source, then who are you to override that and say, no, I don't want to listen to that? Which brings me to my seventh point, and I might get some hate for this or some laughs depending on it liberalism right and when I say liberalism I don't mean some like there's different definitions of this I mean the modern day definition of being a liberal right I don't want to get too much into it that what that means but basically liberal woman and I'm gonna talk about a man second you know actually so that sisters don't get mad let me put number eight here just Traditionalism, okay? Because some people put conservative traditionalism over and above the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm being fair here. But let's go to liberalism first, then I'm going to go to traditionalism. Liberalism. A liberal woman by default will not make a good wife because she's trained not to put her family over and above her career, okay? She can put the rights of trees over and above her family. She can put the rights of... Uh, the, the downtrodden and the poor over and above her family but by default she's not trained to put her family first she's trained to compete with her husband not to serve her husband and actually to serve her husband or even to mention that a woman should serve her husband is actually considered very derogatory in the liberal world view so never mind that liberals actually have good and a lot of liberals actually have good intentions and they want to help save the world and they want to help people get out of poverty and they want to like have equality between the different genders and fill in the pay gaps but at home they'll throw all of that behind their back because again what's the liberal point of view saying it, it, go, it talks down against marriage and it talks down against these traditional institutions and it goes more like you know you set your own type of morality which is again it goes over and above no you do not set your own morality Allah sets what morals and what right and wrong means because we can grow up in a society full of cannibals and we think cannibalism was right if we grew up on some island 500 years ago. But just because we grew up that way and we think it's right, doesn't mean that it is right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing and He tells us what is right and what is wrong. And of course we have a sense in our heart that allows us to kind of differentiate between the two. So when it comes to liberalism and, and what they believe in, like you can go up to a liberal college professor and someone can say, hey, I'm homosexual and I want to marry my, my boyfriend. And, sh and, and that liberal professor will be like, oh, yeah, great, that's amazing, you know. And then the same liberal professor, a, a young girl could come up to him and be like, look, I love my husband and I want to marry him. I want to be there for him. I want to serve him. And that same liberal professor could probably be like, why are you doing that? Why are you putting yourself? You have so much to live for. You have a career. You have everything. Why would you just give it all up for a husband? So you can't really reason with these people. So if you see 
extreme liberalism, that's a big red flag. Now the next red flag is for the sisters looking out for the brothers. Traditionalism. A lot of people put their stupid traditions and their culture over and above the deen of Allah. I'll give you a good example. One example is, I know of a story of someone and the, uh, the person saw that this man's baby, the woman was out for work, she was out doing something, and the baby had pooped his pants and he needed to have his diapers changed. And he was like, no, nah, a man is not supposed to change the diapers. All right, that's just like not supposed to be done in this country. So he was going to leave his baby with a rash or with some other health problems because the poop was going to be in his pants for hours instead of just changing the freaking diapers, you know. So that type of traditional thinking is what a woman should watch out for. And it's usually very clear. People that are religious, not because they truly want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but just because that's how they grew up. And they're just following the traditions without really thinking about it. Like what the Quran says, that these people simply are following what they saw their fathers and their forefathers doing without really putting much thought into it. So this is also a problem. If someone's too traditional, like again, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he was known to have sewn his own clothes, to have cooked his own meals, not all the time, but many, a lot of the times he did do that. So if a guy is coming and saying, look, I'm not going to do that ever, I don't care what your situation is, I don't care if you're tired from pregnancy, I don't care if you had to work, I don't care if you had to study, I don't care about any of that, you have to do these things and I will never do them. That's a kind of very extreme mentality that goes against what the deen says and what the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's example was. So that's something for the sisters to look out for. So brothers, look out for this, sisters, look out for that. And I guess it also goes both ways too, you know. <sighs> Is there anything else? Ah, uh, now we come to number nine. Can I erase this? No, it might take too much time. Let's put number nine here. I'm going to just make a big divide here. Hopefully you all can follow this. Number nine. I'm going to put this in capital letters here, the past, right? Because everybody has a past. And <laughs> you might not know what that past is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might hide it from you. Look, I'm going to make a whole separate topic on this because this is very, very, very important, extremely important. Some people are on one side of the camp where if anyone did anything, they will never consider them for marriage. And other people are on the other side of the camp where it's like, I don't care what he did or she did, as long as they did their toba, I'm okay. Which is also another extreme, right? Because we don't know if the toba was sincere, we don't know if that person's going to relapse. And here, this is very judgmental because everybody makes mistakes, including the person saying that, you know. So how do we go into the middle on this? My advice is we look into the past, whatever you're comfortable handling, but when you find out about the past, you need to ask yourself one very simple question. Are they over the past or is it still with them, right? Because someone could have resolved the issues of their past and they're ready. And by past, I don't mean one, necessarily, one necessary thing. I don't mean relationships. I don't mean drugs. I don't mean uh, family abuse or family past. I, I could anything, anything, anything is the past. Anything that you don't like, anything that we had to go through to overcome. And a lot of the times when people overcome a strong, hard, difficult past, they become much better people. So that past you may not like could actually be the reason that you like the person that you like today. So something else to keep in mind. But what do we look out for? What's, when does the past become a red flag? When they still haven't resolved it. When I was working in the psychiatric hospital back in Egypt a few years ago, one of the fellow doctors that I knew, he had a lot of patients that had a problem with masturbation. And he said that a lot of them thought that when they got married they would stop. But they didn't stop and they kept doing it. So you see, this is a problem. Someone's coming, coming in married and they're bringing their past with them. Especially even worse is when they don't tell their partner about the past. Then they're solving it all by themselves and the partner's saying, what the hell's going on? I didn't know all this. I didn't sign up for this. Why didn't you tell me all this? At least the partner could have helped. Or they had the freedom of choice to say no. And I know some scholars say that uh, you should keep the past only between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the default position. But there are circumstances where Sahaba shared some things that they did with others to use it as a lesson or to use it as some type of uh, guidance for someone else to say, hey, look, I've been through some, something similar. Or to say that, look, don't look at me as the best person. I've done some wrong too. I'm a human just like you. So the, 
even even the the Sahaba had shared some things that they've done that they weren't necessarily proud of to kind of use it as a lesson for others. So there's a there's a reason why someone would and would not share the past, and that's a whole other topic. I won't get into that. Suffice to say, for the purpose of this video, if the past is still behind them, then you have a very difficult decision to make. Will you believe them and support them in trying to get over it, or will you just say, "Look, this is too much for me to handle. I can't. I gotta. I gotta go." You know. So that's 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 there. You know, and and. There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer, it's just what's right or wrong for you because someone might be able to handle a certain type of past that their partner had and someone else just might not be able to handle that and we can't say who's who, you know? So it's better to know this before you sign the nikah contracts than to know after, you know? But if you know after, I'll make a video on that inshallah on this topic because this is an important topic. So all in all, we have nine things and there's way more. I mean, we, this list could go on for so long. Red flags can, can be anything you can think of. But as long as you think of a red flag as what is it that they put over their deen? That's the red flag. So I want you to think of something. Look to a person that you're interested in and say, okay, I see their practice. I see their friends. I see their activities. I see what they're not doing. I see how they're talking to their family. I see all of these things. And be honest and write it down if you have to write it down and, and look at the positives and the negatives and then think to yourself, okay, in five, if they continue doing what they were doing in five years from now, would they be closer to Allah or would they be further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is, that is a very good question to ask because you can see someone who's wearing the hijab now or you can see someone who has a beard now, but then you look at all of these practices and all of these things that they're doing then you're like, in five years from now, are they going to take off their hijab? Are they going to stop praying? Or are they going to be even better and even closer to Allah SWT as a person? I want to give you guys a good example of this. Is uh, Think about a very conservative culture like Saudi Arabia or uh, Yemen, where everybody is trained to wear the niqab from a young age. Someone could wear the niqab and their wearing of the niqab is not necessarily tested, right? It's not necessarily tested. And you don't know whether they're wearing the niqab because their parents said so, because of traditionalism, or because they truly love to do so because they believe that that's what Allah told them. Versus, let's say, another girl who grew up in a country where the hijab is banned or it's looked down upon, or you're going through extreme social pressure to take off that hijab. But through a lot of fighting, she wears the hijab, right? And she's like, I'm going to do this. Who's more covered? Obviously, the person with the niqab. But who's trying so much harder to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In this example, it's obviously the person who's wearing the hijab. So we always have to take the, all of these factors into account, where they're coming from, their environment. Just like the ayat in the Quran in the beginning was talking about a righteous, a righteous home and evil uh, spouses coming from it. And then the second, uh, the verse after I was talking about an evil home with the righteous spouse coming from it. And then the third, uh, the, the verse after that, which is the last verse in Surah Al-Tahrim, is talking about a righteous spouse, oh no, well, she wasn't a spouse, a righteous mother coming out of a righteous home. You know, So all of these examples can happen. Just because someone comes from a bad background doesn't mean they can't be a very good spouse or mother or father for you, uh, for, your, for, your, for your, for a spouse for you and a father or mother for your children. And the opposite is true. Just because you see someone coming from a good background and a good environment does not mean that they're going to be good for you. It could, could be the opposite. Obviously, you want the best of the best, but being humans, there's always going to be something that you're going to have to deal with that you don't like. And that's just the nature of the dunya. So ultimately, to sum everything up, all of these red flags, you can like write it down. There's more that you can think of, if you can think of, because I know this is not an exhaustive list by any means. There's probably a lot more red flags someone can think of. But the umbrella, the main idea is lack of deen is the number one red flag. Anything that someone puts over the deen of Allah, that's, that's what you see as a red flag. You know? and, and, and no one's perfect, so there's always going to be something that someone's going to work on. I hope that helped everyone. Take care. Peace out. Assalamu alaikum. Anything good I say is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything bad I say or wrong I said or a mistake I made is from myself. So please forgive me for that. If I made it, if you have anything to comment on, please leave it in the comment section. Like and subscribe as it helps my channel grow and this video can reach more people and benefit more people. Jazakallah khair everyone. Assalamu alaikum.